Hey, you guys, and greetings from Tennessee. I hope you're all doing well today. Today is a fantastic day because we're all still here, and I hope you guys look at that the way I do. Today, we're going to talk about an artillery shell from the Civil War that uh, has its own style. <laughs> there are a lot of them out there, but <laughs> nothing quite looks like this one. They are officially known as the Schenkel, S-C-H-E-N-K-L, uh, shell. They used over 400,000 of them during the war, but the guy that designed it didn't have a patent on it. Uh, he had a patent on the fuse, but not the shell itself. There was a cat in Boston, Massachusetts named James P. Schenkel, S-C-H-E-N-K-L. Weird name, but he had a, he was a brilliant guy. And uh, several of the artillery guys of the day said that these shells, when they worked, they were the best. When they didn't, they were the worst. So uh, as with many things, the things that made it special were also the things that held it back. Uh, <clears throat> these were all made at one factory. They were all made by the Cyrus, Ames, uh, Cyrus Alger Company, same company that made a lot of the artillery shells in Boston. Uh, they also made the shells. So there's a lot of different versions of them. This one is one that I think is interesting because of a couple of traits we're gonna talk about in a minute, but they stand out from all the rest because of what's up on the top. This is a shell that is called a case shot. What does that mean? It means that on the inside of it, it has uh, balls inside designed to explode and cause more damage, wreak more havoc. Uh, case shot, and that's why the nose of this is more rounded than a lot of them that are very pointed. Uh, that's so they could fit more case shot balls on the inside of it. The balls uh, in most case shot shells will show up either as iron balls or lead balls. Uh, sometimes the Southerners actually used bullets in there to fill the cavities, not with a shinkle because they were all very well factory made shells. This one is cut in half. You can actually see the balls on the inside of it. Uh, if you notice the shape of the shell, it has the larger front and then it tapers off on the back and it has ribs. Uh, what are those ribs for? Why would you go to the trouble to put those on there? It's because this shell used a, uh, with a design that we call a sabot. And the sabot is what takes the rifling of the gun. Most of the time it's either lead or copper, sometimes iron, but it causes the shell or projectile to spin when it leaves the rifle cannon barrel. This one, instead of having lead or instead of having iron or instead of having copper, it used paper mache. Yep, that's crazy, ain't it? Paper mache. And actually it turns out to be his wife, uh, Frederica Schinkel, that's a hell of a name, ain't it? Yeah, on January 17th, 1865, year of our Lord, she got a patent for that paper mache Sabbath <laughs> almost after the war's over, but hey, she stuck with it and got it. So good for you, Frederica. But a paper mache Sabbath, it was made up of paper pulp, resins, gums, oils, um, and it was designed to help it spin. Worked really, really well, like all of the uh, people that inspected the artillery and all that. They said it worked perfectly if that paper mache sabot was uh, produced perfectly and it lined up in the uh, barrel correctly. They said if it got wet or if it got damaged, that it wouldn't load into the gun correctly and then it wouldn't fire correctly because uh, it actually, when it worked perfectly, it formed a it formed a perfect seal in there and let the shell fire uh, more true and as it should. Uh, and it also was favored because you can imagine the sabots on the other ones, if they ripped apart while they were flying, they were probably going to fall on your men. <laughs> uh, with a paper mache, it's okay. But if it's lead, that could cause some trouble. Less friendly fire with the shingle shell. That would have made the infantryman in front of the artilleryman a little bit uh, safer. So, uh, bad weather was a bad thing for him. But if it worked perfectly, formed that great seal, which is why the flame from the blast couldn't reach the front of the shell. So we don't see uh, time fuses used with shingles. You see percussion fuses, uh, which he had a patent on. He had a patent on the fuse in 1861. 
Uh, the one that this is, is a, is a crazy design. It had so much stuff going on it that you don't see a lot of them uh, surviving because they're multiple parts and they would break easily. They would come apart easily. If you fired them, a lot of times they were melted. Uh, this one is pretty. They used a combination fuse, meaning that you could set it for a time. So at the top, you turn the top and this is what the diagram shows that it looks like. You turn that top to the desired fuse time. So you'd set it to four seconds if you wanted to blow up four seconds in flight, uh, or you could uh, wait for it to strike and be a percussion fuse. Most of the time, something went south and not a lot of them uh, worked the way they were supposed to according to the records. Uh, this particular fuse, he patented on July 15th, 1862. You see them uh, used, and here is actually the cross section of what that fuse looks like. Isn't that neat? Uh, <laughs> it's a big old thing, and you'll see uh, it's neat when you see these when they come out of excavated places, when they're just the fuse, they're gnarled and mangled, and uh, <laughs> they look like they've seen the war. Huh, I guess they did. Uh, but you can go on to shallowrelics.com. You can see this. If you get a chance, read up on Mr. Schinkel. He didn't make it through the war, but uh, he was one of the um, very important artillery shell designers and providers during the war. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schinkel. Uh, <laughs> hope you're doing well wherever you ended up. Uh, today, I want to just say thank you. Uh, I've had a lot of people, man, I've had a lot of people, uh, contact me and tell me that they like the videos when they order, when they're asking. And uh, I, I feel bad because I do not ship internationally anymore. And I've had several of you wonderful people from overseas uh, email lately asking me about it. And it's nothing personal at all. You guys are fantastic. I appreciate you so much. But the postal systems and the UPS systems to get over there, it just ain't worth the hassle. They're a headache uh, beyond measure. Uh, but I wish you guys the best. I appreciate you taking time to watch these videos, and I think the world of you. There are a lot of good people all around this world. That's one thing I've learned in this business. Uh, but I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you share these videos, and I want to say thank you for all of you that have. We've got a lot of new subscribers. Uh, I had a very, very good friend of mine ask me when I'd be back on Antiques Roadshow, and I said, I found that I like the YouTube channel a lot more than... Uh, a lot of the things about the road show because I could tell you my opinion on things. I can tell you uh, my positive, hopefully you all see them as positives at the end of the video because I want them to be. And I'm happier here. It was a wonderful time in my life. I did that show for 19 years, made some of the best friends. A lot of the people on the crew uh, are some of the most wonderful people that I have ever met in my life, but I like you guys and I'm staying here and I am happy. I'm very thankful. And uh, I wish you guys only the best and thank you for taking time. Please share these videos. Please tell your friends about them. And remember, I appreciate you. I hope y'all have the best day you've ever had in your whole life and I'll catch you next time.